thank everyone for the invitation to participate in your meeting this evening. And I think I'm going to, due to, in the interest of time and due to my delay, I'll go through the overview. I think Nancy did a really good job of summarizing how the Western Reserve Land Conservancy tries to approach the harmony between land, communities, and different levels of biodiversity in a unique way. Um, and Nancy, I believe you mentioned that your your next field mapping is actually going to be at uh, in the Richfield Preserve, the Coral Halaka property. That's correct. That's correct. That's um, so that's a project that some of my colleagues worked on. We worked on the transaction side of that. So that's a good example of something that I would say we would do in our more traditional sense of uh, the land conservancy, but something that I don't work on given my sort of status with the urban team. So without further ado, I, I will sort of go through this. This is who I am. Um, Betsy can share. I'm, I'm more than happy to have a call or a follow-up email with anyone if you have other questions. So a brief overview. The Western Reserve Land Conservancy, another unique aspect is that we were actually formed through the merger of eight smaller land trusts in 2006. It was the largest ever merger of land trusts um, to date, and that has really extended our boundaries and our service areas. So today we um, operate from the Pennsylvania border to the east, the Erie Islands to the west, obviously Lake Erie to the north, and down to Wayne County in the south. Here's an overview of some of the properties that we've, we've worked on. So as you can see, we have a handful of properties on Kelly's Island, um, a lot sort of on the eastern part of Cuyahoga County, but then again throughout sort of this northeast Ohio quadrant. These numbers are a little dated. Um, we're actually close to uh, 75,000 acres of preserved properties. And what we say by protected is we, we mostly focus, um, because we are still a relatively small nonprofit, on the transaction and conservation easements of properties. So that means that oftentimes a landowner will maintain fee title ownership in a property, but the Land Conservancy will hold a set of conservation easements which uh, ensures that the land is preserved in its natural state or as close to it as possible uh, in perpetuity. And it's our responsibility to monitor that property on at least an annual basis to make sure that that is being followed. So again, as many of you know, we try to promote uh, the biodiversity in our natural areas. By doing that, we've created over 170 public parks and preserves. And through the Get Out Ohio initiative, we're trying our best to work with the properties that we do own, as well as partner to um, provide even more public access to the properties that have been preserved and conserved. But another initiative, we, we realize that in order for us to be successful, there requires a large amount of harmony in our work, and that goes for the urban um, program thriving communities that I'm a part of, but also with agricultural land, and specifically on the western part, and I know you're the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, so we do a lot of work in Lorraine, Erie County, Seneca even, to preserve um, small family farms. To date, farming is still the largest um, industry by GDP in the state of Ohio, and we understand that small family farms are becoming an endangered species in and of themselves, and so we work with these uh, small family farmers to make sure that their land um, can be uh, preserved in agricultural uses as opposed to being subdivided into suburban tract homes. So that's another sort of area of focus of our, of our pr program offerings. But today what I'm going to be speaking about primarily is our urban revitalization work. So in 2011, former Cuyahoga County Treasurer Jim Rotakis was brought on the Western Reserve Land Conservancy staff, and he was really a leader in the foreclosure crisis while he was treasurer, and um, developed in 2009 the first county land bank in the state of Ohio. And what land banks do, for those that aren't familiar, it's a quasi-governmental entity that is able to take abandoned and tax delinquent properties like this and t put them back into productive use. Unfortunately, structures like these probably need to be demolished, but some can be either rehabbed or can be transferred to a nonprofit or another sort of private user to bring them back on the tax roll and rehabilitate them. So why 
you might be asking is someone that deals with this sort of urban revitalization working for a traditional land trust. And the answer is that, again, back to that harmony, and I'll get to this in some of my future slides, but as we continue to put further and further pressures on uh, development into our outlying areas, that makes our conservation work more difficult to achieve. So by creating healthy, safe, stable communities within our urban cores where people um, sort of where we view them to be living or should be living, and it provides that balance of keeping our natural areas natural and our cities um, uh, where we have our densest areas of, of population. So that um, manifests itself in a lot of ways. This is what we call the Adams and Haley's Run complex uh, in Akron in Summit County. I don't know how many of you are familiar with where the Goodyear blimp is, <laughs> is stored, the hangar, as well as sort of the old Akron rubber bulb. This is really close to that, and it was a, in partnership with um, a lot of different partners, um, including sort of some of the larger industrial users down in Akron to re um, channelize this stream corridor. It was essentially used as a ditch to um, dump pollutants in. So do a stream restoration, a tree planting, and then as you can see off to the left of the photo, there's actually a trail system that connects to the intervening neighborhoods. So again, while we think of this as important, as I mentioned previously, in, in 1950, that was the peak population for the city of Cleveland, nearly 1 million people, and today it's right around 380,000, and you can see that that is also correlated to the county, and we're losing population as well. But if you can see the map in the upper left, which is the development pattern in Cuyahoga County in 1950 versus what it is today, it's sort of, we like to say it's like the blob that ate Cleveland. It's suburban sprawl at its, at its zenith. And when we do that, we continue, while we have that great sort of Cleveland Metro Parks Emerald Necklace, um, a lot of the more traditional farmlands that you would see in the south and west part of the county have been developed into suburban-style residential cul-de-sacs. And unfortunately, with that style of development, you have a loss of biodiversity and everything becomes paved over. So this is the percent of tree canopy. There's been a lot of press on this, obviously, pre-COVID. Um, that's been taking the priority of most, um, huh, most of the media's attention. But as you can see, Cleveland's tree canopy is at a dismal 19%. That's actually lower. It's more around 17 or 18% now. And you can see how that increases and changes as you get further away from the city center into the suburban core. And a lot of those um, things of the social determinants of health, the environmental justice components are strongly correlated with the tree canopy. So whether it's um, you know, health outcomes, whether it's economic outcomes, whether it's property values. Uh, I'm not saying those are causal in nature, but they are very highly correlated. And so we're working, and I'll get to this a little later on in my presentation, on reforesting, which was once called the forest city. Again, you can see um, this is sort of child poverty. Again, those uh, demographic indicators that show that um, – you know, the high child poverty rate in the city of Cleveland versus the suburban communities. This is, uh, again, showing the lack of tree canopy correlated with child poverty levels. This is um, an analysis we did with the County Board of Health and one of our property inventories, but to show that elevated blood lead levels in children are higher in areas with lower tree canopy and lower access to green space. Again, the correlation there. And this is actually an aerial imagery taken from Google Earth, and you can actually see the difference in green versus impervious paved over surfaces correlate strongly with the Cleveland border. This area that's highlighted in yellow shows those, the boundaries between the southeast neighborhoods of Cleveland, Mount Pleasant, Buckeye, uh, Wood Hill, and Cleveland Heights and Shaker Heights, which obviously have a very robust tree canopy. Um, you guys are all a friendly audience, so I don't need to go through sort of the uh, carbon and global climate crisis impacts that land conservation has. But by protecting forests, that's even better than planting new forests, especially on large tracts. And so um, the land that we have protected, you know, the 4,000 forested acres, um, 
you know, is, is low, but that's just a scale showing you how much carbon emissions are captured from cars in that way. Same thing goes with the benefits of farmland conservation as well. Um, again, the list goes on and on. Um, conservation has very strong downstream impacts on the health and wellness of our communities. So I wanted to sort of, I know I sort of flew through that overall um, overview section, but before I get into sort of the meat of the talk tonight, the urban, uh, from urban landfill to urban parks, I wanted to just stop and, and ask if anyone had any questions or thoughts on our organization overall before I continue. I hope the silence means that people haven't fallen asleep. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions popping up. Um, Great. Again, in the, on the chat, so I think we'll, if any do come up, we'll 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 uh, ask. I think Wonderful. Is the, is the volume is the volume all right? Uh, so far for me it is. Uh, I hope everybody else can hear. Fantastic. Oh, here's a okay. here's a question that came in. Um, okay. How are you funded? So how is, is Western Reserve Land Conservancy funded? That's, I love getting that question. Um, we really have to hustle to, to get fed in a way. We, um, we rely on about 50% of our funding to come through the land transactions that we perform. Um, so that is sort of the grants that we write, the public funding grants um, that we sort of create. So a lot of it is those types of transactions. And then about 50% of our budget comes from philanthropy and donors. So we, we really rely on um, both of those things to keep our lights on. We have a staff of about 45 at any given time. It's a little lower. Um, we thankfully have not had to lay anyone off due to COVID, but we did have a number of open positions that we did not fill due to uh, the potential financial stress that is uh, upon all of us. All right, another question has come in. Um, I might paraphrase this a little differently. Uh, it says, how do you decide if land is something you want? I think it's certain pieces, mm. parcels of land. Yeah, yeah that's a, a wonderful question. We, again, being uh, a team of limited capacity, we do have to be very discerning in how we do that. And so around, I want to say 2012 or 13, I've been with the organization since 2015, so it was a little before my time, but um, there was a, a process that was undertaken through a variety of organizations, perhaps even your organization was, was part of it, but it was... Um, with all of the park districts sort of in Northeast Ohio, um, the soil and water district, uh, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District and others. And we created this really robust GIS system to create a suitability analysis on trying to determine and model which land had the highest value from a conservation standpoint. So think of things that were, again, already forested or were close to a riparian corridor. Those things would score higher in the model and we continue to try and work against that model when we go after projects. But oftentimes, a lot of our most successful projects are the ones that are brought to us, either by someone who has worked with us in the past, maybe they have a neighbor. But we like to build corridors um, and build off of existing protected properties that have some benefits for us from a monitoring standpoint, but also from a biodiversity and habitat standpoint as well. So we try and be very data-focused in discerning which projects, you know, um, I'm only one person sort of working in the urban area. So if someone calls and says, oh, there's this vacant parcel in Maple Heights, you know, that has to be weighed against a handful of other projects before we commit to working on it. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, there will be times for other thoughts and questions. So if anything else comes up. We can, uh, we can pause on that, but I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. So again, the urban conservation, how and why we do what we do. 
um, you know, with a lot of the social unrest rest after the killing of George Floyd, and, you know, for those of you that have lived in, in the area for a long time, um, racial disparities continue to be a really strong burden for a lot of our communities. And what this map shows is the old 1940s um, lending maps from the HOLC that was a federally backed um, lending program through the Federal Housing Authority. And you can see that the areas that are were redlined um, in the 30s and 40s continue to be the most distressed areas in our cities. And so we're really cognizant of that history and that sort of systemic racism that we continue to deal with, but want to create um, a more equitable future moving forward. So again, we try and use this this historic data, even though it's not um, positive in any way, um, to inform our work. Again, more information on how um, even the racist housing practices from redlining in the 30s created more urban, urban heat island effects today. So what do we do? We do property inventories, and that's um, where we have a group of uh, a team. That was the first thing I worked on with the Land Conservancy in Cleveland in 2015. A team of 16 people took photos of every parcel in the city of Cleveland. That's over 158,000 parcels, and would classify it based on residential, commercial, if it were vacant, and we would actually give each uh, building a letter grade, A through F, just like you'd see on your report card. F meant that it was an unsafe, uninhabitable condition and needed to be demolished or rehabbed substantially. A was that it was occupied and in great working condition. So here's sort of a, uh, an illustration of what we can do then after those most distressed properties are removed, how we can create a more ecologically and socially beneficial space through the side yards that program that people can apply for. So if you live in that blue house and you would like to expand your yard, you can go through a program with the city of Cleveland for a very nominal cost or the Cuyahoga land bank acquire that yard next to you. But for those that do not have any adjacent landowners, how can we do something with the city of Cleveland that's more beneficial for the neighborhood than just mowing grass? three times a year? How can we plant trees? How can we create ground cover? How can we deal with soil compaction? And for your purposes, how can we create a more welcoming habitat for um, sort of flora and fauna within the city of Cleveland? So today, what the, the purpose of this talk is to talk about the Emerald Valley Henninger site, which we're now calling Brighton Park, which was a former landfill. Here's an aerial view. Just to give everyone a little bit of context, this red outline is the site. It's 26 acres right in the heart of the city of Cleveland, adjacent to Big Creek. Um, as you can see where my cursor is right here, that's Pearl Road, also known as West 25th. Up to the north is Metro Hospital. To the west is the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. To the west even further is Brookside Reservation. And this is Steelyard Commons to the northeast. So what we're really excited about with this project is that we're going to be able to create a trail network that would connect Brookside Reservation through the Metro Parks Zoo, a little bit of on grade here, through our Brighton Park project, through this residential neighborhood, to Harmony Park, to Treadway, and ultimately to connect to the north on the to recently completed Towpath Trail, which is very exciting. So you're going to have a very robust trail network as well as a passive park in the heart of Cleveland's largest neighborhood by population. I don't expect anyone to uh, have attended this baseball game, but this is really cool that um, this was an amateur baseball game in Brookside Reservation where over 100,000 people uh, um, attended a baseball game, which is, is hard to fathom today, but is really, really impressive. Um, here is an overview of the site um, with the topography. So as you can see, over time, the, the landfill has really grown in an elevated manner. This is Big Creek here to the north. And what we're proposing, we have some updated site plans, but this all-purpose trail will cut through the center of the site, and then there will be a natural surface foot trail that will create a walking loop and ultimately go to an overlook. This is someone asked sort of how we um, raise revenue in every way we can. My 
Supervisor Jim um, is Greek, and he likes to call this sort of the baklava of funding. So to create this, this is just the improvements. This isn't even the acquisition. That was another $600,000. But we have received money from Private Philanthropy, Arconic Foundation, Kent Smith, Bank of America, Cleveland Foundation, as well as a lot of public funding. The Clean Ohio Conservation Fund, which is administered by the Ohio Public Works Commission, OPWC, we received a $50,000 county grant through the casino revenue um, to sustain our Great Lakes. This is a federal grant, and this is what some of your members have been interested in. This actually allows us to plant trees, uh, remediate some invasive species removal, and create a meadow habitat. And then this recreational trails program is paying for this trail system, and this is also a federal program that's administered by the state through, the, um, through ODNR. So real quick, hopefully this will work on everyone's computer, but this is um, a drone footage of the site just to give you a little more context of, of, um, of everything. And I don't, unfortunately, I think maybe since we're doing this via screen share, it might not play. But, oh, no, here we go. Excellent. So this is looking to the north over Big Creek and the Industrial Valley. There was actually... A historic, I don't know about historic, but I consider it a historic go-kart track that was here before that you can sort of see in the foreground. We are dealing with about a dozen people that currently live on the site and are experiencing homelessness. You can see someone walking to their uh, structures there. Off to the right is the old service road. That is roughly where the all-purpose trail is going to go through the site. To the left of, the, of your screen, you can see where Big Creek runs through. So, again, we're very... Uh, close and adjacent. This property was a key connector through a lot of plans, both the Big Creek Connect, the Cuyahoga County Greenways plan, um, the Emerald Valley, uh, Emerald Necklace updated plan that Metro Parks put together, as well as the Old Brooklyn Master Plan. You can see up to the, to the east, but in the upper left corner, this is still an active industrial site on the other side of the, of the river where sand and gravel are stored and processed. But there's also, again, for being in the heart of the city of Cleveland, a very robust tree canopy um, here, as well as a very dense neighborhood um, just to the south. You can see a lot of the multifamily buildings. The population density of the site is actually equivalent to the average of a Chicago neighborhood. So you're going to have a lot of great access to deal with. Up to the north here is the other part of the metro, um, the metro hospital campus, and then we're looking into the heart of the old Brooklyn neighborhood, and then you can see the zoo up here and the upper right-hand corner of the screen. So again, you're really in the heart of the neighborhood, but you feel very isolated and secluded, which gives it a very nice feel um, for an urban park. Here is, again, an overview of the connections. This is Brighton Park here in the center, but how it will connect to other. This towpath trail is in orange over here, Cleveland Metro Park Zoo and Brookside Reservation, as well as some uh, proposed trails that the city of Cleveland is going to be working on to create those on-street connections. And here's the general park site plan, again, with a little more detail of where we're hoping to put a lot of the vegetation and trees. We've been working with your member Tom Romito and others to um, make sure that the trees that are planted on the site will provide the most robust habitat for urban birding, which we're really excited about as well. So we're, again, trying to find that harmony and balance between the different types of users, both people and then also wildlife. And obviously, this landfill was primarily used for construction debris, but is something that, you know, has needed a lot of remediation as well. I, I sort of glossed over that, but we spent about two years working with Ohio EPA to remediate the site um, and receive a voluntary, through the Voluntary Action Program, a covenant not to be sued for operating the site. There are restrictions on the site. You're not allowed now to build anything. It has our conservation easement on it. We're not allowed to have a baseball field, anything like this, legitimately just a passive park. So I went through that quickly, but given our late start, I wanted to provide um, an ample opportunity to talk about this in more detail 
um, before I go into some of our other program offerings through our thriving communities, our urban program of the Land Conservancy. Isaac, this is Gloria Ferris. I'm I'm wondering. Um, <clears throat> I know it's very difficult to say what's happening with the uh, COVID-19 crisis mm -hmm. and how we're kind of like back now to kind of shutting down again voluntarily for people to to uh, shelter in place. But I just wondered if. Um, there's like a timeline of when you're going to start planting trees or when the trail or I mean, maybe just based on what it was before <laughs> yes. this happened, just to, to know the time frame, I guess. How many yeah, years that's, that's, is going to be? No, and, and I think, you know, Gloria, it obviously has impacted our timeline, but we're still very optimistic. We still have to work through a few areas of compliance. Um, because it is an old landfill with the Ohio EPA, we have to go through what's called the Rule 513 regulation to allow us to do anything on the site. So we're going to break up the improvements on the site into two phases. The first phase will be those trails that I mentioned and the <laughs> overlook, more of the hardscape. That is actually, knock on wood, I have a project update called tomorrow. We're hoping to open, or sorry, to begin construction on those trails in early August of this year, so about a month from today. We expect those trails to be finished and open to the public um, around November. So obviously not necessarily the, the most ideal time uh, for Northeast Ohio to open up a park, but that's where we're, you know, it's good at least from a construction standpoint, to use the dry season or the warm season, summer months, to begin construction. Now, for the tree planting and the meadow restoration, we're going to do some site prep work in the fall, but th those plantings are going to take place primarily in spring of 2021. Okay, well, thanks. That, that, that's very optimistic, and I'm really hoping that that can happen. So, um, yes. good. Thanks, thanks for it that. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, it is optimistic, are, but we're hoping. Yeah, there are a couple of other questions that came in. One of them was, uh, again, re regarding a timeline. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if, if all of the timeline was covered. Um, but another question came in about using, uh, do you use professional consultants on selecting plants? Mm, yes. So. I'm glad you brought that up because my background is in city and regional planning. So I will be the first to admit that my skills as a naturalist are, are limited. The way we're going to go about that, we have received funding to plant approximately a thousand trees. Um, now we understand due to the site conditions of this uh, area, we're not expecting you know a hundred percent mortality, but we hope it was proper site prep and species selection, specifically around the trees and, and shrubs and plants, that we will be successful in that. So we've sort of taken an all-hands-on-deck approach. I know some members or friends of Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society have been out to the site multiple times and have been working on suggestions. We have a proposal. I don't think we're going to necessarily use it fully, but a proposal from Davy Resource Group on exactly that question. We also have a community forester who's a certified arborist on staff that has been doing soil sampling and evaluations on the planting. And then obviously, one thing that I, I failed to mention that's really important, the Land Conservancy is gonna maintain ownership of this park in perpetuity of this land, but Cleveland Metro Parks is going to manage it on a day-to-day -day basis. So their park rangers will be there and we will take advantage of their incredible staff and resources on the plant and species selection to go in there. I don't know, for those of you who know Connie, Dr. Connie Hausman, she's been involved, and all of the Metro Park staff will weigh in when we get ready for the planting in the spring. I think, I think that kind of answers another question. It says, uh, we're going to be planting native trees and plants, and I would, I would guess with with uh, the consultants, with the Metro Parks, that 
yeah, I think it's going to go native. So yes, and yeah. and one thing I think we always try and plant native while we can, and I know that's something that Metro Parks is also um, very cognizant of as well. That being said, we recognize there is nothing native about a landfill and the degradation that we did on it. And so um, there is um, a school of thought within uh, urban forestry specifically now that, especially with climate change, we need to make sure that we're planting a resilient, uh, heterogeneous mix of trees. So native while you when you can but not necessarily discrediting something to be planted that is non-native if it might be able to adapt to a difficult site and changing climate interesting wow oh that's interesting yeah um and another question came in uh what type of toxins were on site i know you mentioned it was uh construction debris uh, but uh, were there any toxins present yes so um, again, another disclaimer that I am, I am not a, a chemist or an industrial scientist. Um, the good news is that we actually only had to remediate less than an acre of the, the site back in 2016. So we had to bring in fill and, and cap less than an acre of the 26-acre site. And unfortunately, I cannot remember the toxins that were, that were removed at that time. Um, so someone else on our team actually handled the remediation effort. Um, but if that's something that someone is really con- uh, interested in, I'd be happy to share sort of um, we work with Partners Environmental on doing that work, and there's a very lengthy report that we had to submit to the Ohio EPA on the Phase 1 and Phase 2 environmental testing that was done. Very good. And Betsy in the chat has put in uh, where to contact either you uh, or – Western Reserve Land Conservancy, um, and the website, Twitter, following on Twitter, Facebook. Perfect. So all of that, That's that great. all of that is in the chat, and uh, you know, so should somebody have a question um, that's a little more concerned about some other things, um, yeah. Yeah, and that's what has been so great about the partnership with your organization is that, you know, we have members of our staff that are avid birders. We actually have um, a friends group um, that that does sort of one group does photography, another does sort of birding on a lot of our properties. But being able to have members of your team come out and make suggestions and have a different approach or a different set of values to bring to what is planted from um, a uh, sort of a bird habitat has been fantastic and I've, I've really appreciated that and the in, uh, there is information on the on this particular project on the website yes there is and okay. more to come once we get um, finalized designs and a finalized construction timeline we want to be a little more confident um, on, on all of that but there was just recently I don't know what we're if we're still calling it the plain deal or not, but Steve Litt wrote an article probably a week or two ago um, that sort of announced the, the forthcoming nature of this part. Right. So there's more information there as well. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thanks. I think we'll continue on. Okay. Yes, and so I would say that's sort of section two. And, again, being cognizant of our own time, I know um, you all have been – on your screens for even longer than I have. I'll go through this last section a little bit quickly, but I also wanted to sort of say some other projects that we're working on in the city of Cleveland that I think your group might be interested in. They're a little smaller in scale, but we hope we'll have some significant impact in the neighborhoods. These are all in those three neighborhoods around the old St. Luke's Hospital on the southeast side of Cleveland. So the first one is the Garden of Eleven Angels. This is sort of the existing condition and everyone is probably familiar with this site, even if you don't know about it. It's off of Imperial Avenue. And this is actually the former site of where um, Anthony Sowell um, viciously murdered 11 women um, in, in the early or mid-2000s. And so the homes, the structures have been demolished, and we are working with the faith-based community, 
um, the Community Development Corporation and others to create um, a memorial garden. We are hoping to fully fund this by the end of the calendar year as well and create um, on the adjacent lots to the west, there are about five additional vacant, vacant parcels that we hope to plant trees on as well. So this will be, again, smaller, but in total will probably be eight or nine um, residential parcels with this memorial garden with a monument as its, as its touchstone in remembrance of the women that were lost. Another one uh, that has really strong uh, social connotations is the Ubuntu Gathering Place that's in partnership with the East End Neighborhood House. For those of you that may recognize this, this is off of Shaker Boulevard. It used to be an old Saab dealership. And we're hoping to work with East End Neighborhood House, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer Districts, and others to have a gathering place. Um, and in this time of COVID, it's, those types of places are more important than ever, especially to reflect on the cultural traditions. And Ubuntu in uh, Swahili means um, I am because you are, and that I see you, and therefore um, we all are as one. So it's a very wonderful project that is being led by the East End Neighborhood House and that we're helping with the, the project fundraising and design with. Just to orient everyone, this is Shaker Boulevard. This is the East End Neighborhood House. It's over 100 years old. There's a new rapid station here, and then the Ubuntu site is going to be uh, right here. This is Hidden Garden. This is working with the adjacent church, the Calvary Hill Church in Christ to create a community space for their congregation. It's also right next to, um, going back a slide, this is the church, this is the hidden garden right here, to work with them to create um, a community garden. This would be a low cost, but we'd be a high impact intervention um, that the church has been very passionate about for a long time. This site is the Mount Pleasant Green Space. There were, used to be homes on this site as well. It's at, um, off of Kinsman 117th next to the historic uh, Henry's Cleaners, a longtime small business. And we're going to be working on creating a pathway. We already have an RTA bus shelter in place. We planted over a dozen trees this spring on the site. But again, creating more of a little micro uh, pocket park in a pretty paved over part of, of town that's dealt with a lot of property distress. And this project is Thea Bowman, which is um, a social service agency that deals with um, uh, childhood poverty and, and other sort of um, social services uh, for families as well, food distribution and the like, especially during coronavirus. There's a pre-K program here as well, but we want to take this really obnoxious, uh, impervious surface and turn it into something while still having a little bit of parking. Again, that's something that people, children, can uh, activate and spend time. And we've uh, acquired these parcels that are adjacent to the parking lot already and are working on a, a plan with OHM advisors on how to create this and go after some green infrastructure grant money through the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer Districts Grant Program. Um, and last but certainly not least, this is another um, very sort of heart-wrenching story. These properties um, were vacant and Officer Derek Owens was responding to a call of some people that were doing some illegal activity in the garage of one of the houses, and there was a confusion, and unfortunately, Derek Owens was shot and killed. But in his place, this was opened in last October, is this pocket park. Again, it's a little more traditional with a play structure, um, and sort of it's only on, I believe, three residential parcels, but it's a nice, tranquil spot, a very beautiful memorial, and the Cleveland Police Foundation um, did a great job leading this project that we assisted on and um, will maintain the project moving forward. So again, taking something that was um, an asset, removing the toxicity both from um, sort of the psyche of the neighborhood and then creating something that is a neighborhood asset. So we're very proud to have played a, a part in this project as well. Um, and last but not least, I want to just sort of go over a little bit. I already touched on a little bit, but our reforest, uh, our city program initiative. Again, I, I can't stress enough how important tree canopy is. You all know this, but we really don't have a substantial um, public funding investment or leadership on this issue. So we, um, we all know the benefits of trees. There are too many to list here. 
Um, but we, w- how we address this is we, we train um, neighborhood residents to be tree stewards. So that's how to properly plant, prune, and maintain trees uh, through establishment. We help neighborhood groups on tree plantings, and we also do res- residential tree distributions. Um, to date, we've, we've planted over 1,500 trees and distributed many, many more. And we look forward to continuing to grow this um, project moving forward. We're trying to work with the city of Cleveland on allowing more tree planting on vacant lots. And that's something that we're really passionate about. But we are part of the Cleveland Tree Coalition as well as these organizations. So while we have a lot of passion around it, we still have not been able to get substantial public funding. And I, I'm afraid in this time of coronavirus with state and local budgets being what they are, we're probably not going to see a big influx of capital even though trees are essential infrastructure. Um, We lead the Cleveland uh, Arbor Day and Arbor Week over the last number of years, which has been great. We go to a different neighborhood every year and work with community groups on a tree planting and a tree giveaway. Um, We partner with Mitchell's Ice Cream to give away tree seedlings and uh, local breweries to uh, create a local tree-themed beer and to promote all of this important work. Um, obviously, all of our work we feel is even more prescient given the time and impact of COVID-19. We need to all get outside, we need to reforest our city, and we need to continue to fund these important public infrastructure and public amenities um, in this time more than ever when we're all physically distancing and have had to be indoors a lot more than I think any of us would, would care to be. So again, I apologize very much for the technical difficulties that I had at the beginning of this presentation. I hope this was um, somewhat informative and interesting and that uh, you get half as much pleasure of uh, this work as as I do. So I appreciate your time and patience tonight um, on this presentation. Well, I think it was fabulous. I mean, I want to go see all these pocket parks and, and, you know, get involved with tree planting and uh, you know, I, I just find urban areas just ripe for again birding, uh, getting people out. It's it's great. Um, it, again, if anybody has a, a question or two, we can uh, get a couple yeah, more. Yeah, happy. Answers. And on our website, we do have a list of publicly accessible properties. So if you care to explore, or again, there are many people on our stewardship team that would love if there if you wanted to have a group outing similar to what you're doing at Kroll Halaka property, we we like to do those types of things as well. So I might not be the best person to lead on some of those ex-urban properties, but we're happy to be, to put you in touch with someone who would. Oh, fantastic. Isaac, this is Gloria again, and I have a question for you. Um, You, you talked about the vacant lots um, Mm -hmm. in city of Cleveland and, uh, you know, wanting to do something besides just mowing three three times a year and, and keeping it there. Yep. I wonder if you've had any success or if you've approached the city of Cleveland that when they demolish a house, the, the grass uh, seed combination that they spread is just... Um, not a very good quality, a lot Mm -hmm. of weed. And I know that um, in our area, I live in the city of Cleveland, and we had a a really good gal, uh, Sasha, oh, I don't remember Sasha's last name, but she um, she and I discussed it, and I said that, you know, if they planted clover, I mean, it would be, it would stay lower, it would put nutrients back into the the um, soil, and also ryegrass. I mean, I think that mm-hmm. they could do a better combination for re- remediating the soil uh, because, as you say, the funding is is going to be tight for pocket mm-hmm. parks kind of things you're thinking. But if they just did a better job at remediating um, – what when they take houses down? I think it would be a big help. I just wondered if you knew. Are you are you thinking of doing anything, or have you tried? 
uh, with the city of Cleveland to get something like that going. I, lo I love where you're I love where you're and, and this is this is something that I think that we're, I really think really trying we're really trying to promote and promote and have and moving have. forward. I'm getting a little okay. bit of feedback. I don't know. Yeah, if I'm getting some echo. Like, yeah. Oh, you um, know what? Let me let me mute again. Okay, thank you. But but yes, and, and what we're calling this is sort of our groundwork initiative, and it's exactly that. How can we either from a demo perspective or immediately after seed with something so it's less mowing, would also have some ecological benefits. So the ryegrass, the clover, that's a great idea, um, and we're trying to figure out then a way. Um, a balancing, I would say, sort of the three pillars, um, the sort of our organizational capacity and funding to do this, the willingness of the city of Cleveland to do something a little bit different, and also an educational component for the residents. Oftentimes, if you let something go a little more wild, um, Gloria, if you live in the city of Cleveland, you probably hear this. We hear, unfortunately, all the times with trees even. It's, oh, I don't want a tree next to my property because I'll have to rake more leaves or you know, it will mess with my sewer pipes and, and not considering sort of right tree, right place. So I think it needs to be a really large cultural shift. I can say, and not to sort of, you know, bash on city government, but to date, um, and this is the big thing that we're trying to focus on, there was actually money, federal money, to allow greening on lots with, uh, that had been demolished so that you could do that different type of seeding or um, plant trees or the like. And the city of Cleveland would only accept vacant parcels with a certain type of grass on it. They would not even accept a, a lot with trees planted on it or any sort of shrubs or, or bushes or any sort of ground cover. So I think we, we're constantly meeting with the Department of Public Works, the city land bank, the city forester to try and get some movement on that but I think it's definitely more of a marathon than a sprint. But if you would like to be involved in that or have suggestions on you think what would work, you know, I'm more than, I'd be, we would love to have our team talk with you about that. So thanks I, for bringing that up. And just to I give people really, a sense. I will email you, Isaac, about that. Because that would I, be great. I, I'm really passionate. We would love to talk with you. We would love to talk okay. with you. But just so for everyone's perspective, um, and these aren't all from demolitions, but as far as vacant lots in the city of Cleveland, out of that 158,000 parcels I told you about, we're dealing with nearly 30,000 vacant parcels. So the need is enormous. That's twice the size of Hopkins Airport, if you were to aggregate all the way wow. together. Wow, wow, wow. All right. Let me, let me just uh, ask one more quick question. There's a lot of thank yous on the chat. Um, are there organizations in the city that promote the value of soil enriching and native plants in the urban landscape? I thought I saw that on the one slide you had um, Holden Parks. Um, yeah. Are they? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we work so, with them a lot. Sandra Albro is a good partner there. The Cuyahoga Soil uh, and Water Conservation District is another leading organization in this area. And then I would say Metro Parks, you know, obviously they have a great amount of capacity and skills. Uh, I haven't seen a whole lot of their of interest for them, which is understandable from sort of the soil remediation or whatnot, but um, those are the main orgs. All righty. Well, again, a lot of thank yous. Thank you so much, Mr. Rob. It's, just, it's, been, it's been great. Uh, like I say, I want to get out. I, I, I I think our Western Cuyahoga uh, group will, again, work with some of those urban parks and maybe do some virtual birding there um, and, you know, connect with, with the neighborhood. I think that would be an awesome thing to do. So um, okay, lots of people, great. yeah, checking in, appreciate your work. And uh, I, know, I know, again, partnerships are always really, really important. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. I thank you for your patience and thank you, Betsy. She did such a great job of prepping me and I still messed it up. So no fault <laughs> on her, it's all on me. And she was smiling too. I'd be like sweating. <laughs> I know. No, she's cool as a cucumber. She so, is. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Thank you again so much. I really appreciate it.